Welcome to A Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today is the latest instalment of Axom's daily podcasts. It's something that we've started over the last few weeks and I think now that we've started we'll keep them up. Beyond the lockdown and beyond the coronavirus we will keep up the daily podcasts. Now these will include feature shows with some of the contributors of A Celtic State of Mind such as Celtic by Numbers, which is the statistical show, Screamer Celica, which is uh, Kevin Graham's music stroke Celtic show, and many others, as well as historical content, such as this evening's episode, and we'll also have our regular special guests. As we approach the 31st anniversary of the Hillsborough disaster, we will be speaking next week to Professor Phil Scratton, author of Hillsborough, The Truth. Last week we uploaded the interview we did with Professor Willie Maley, And this week we have spoken to financial expert David Lowe. New content is added to a Celtic State of Minds website on a daily basis. That's axom.net. You can subscribe to a Celtic State of Mind on the website, on our YouTube channel and also on Speaker. And we're currently working on unseen Celtic footage that will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Tonight we delve into the Neely Mocking interview archives to focus on not only the emergence of the Quality Street Kids but also Celtic's second European Cup final in 1970 and we ask Bobby Lennox and Evan Williams where did it all go wrong? Bobby Lennox, the European Cup winning side were famously all homegrown players. Will we ever see your like again? I would really, really doubt that. There's uh, so many foreign players coming in and it'd be difficult to do that I think. I, mean, I was a little outsider. I was, I was 30 miles away in soccer, so I was an outsider. The boys that won the European Cup all kind of played against each other and knew each other when they were younger, and I was a kind of outsider, and that was only 30 miles away, so I really think they struggled to do that again. Jockstein immediately developed another group of homegrown players called the Quality Street Gang. What were your memories of that crop of players? I thought they were terrific, all the boys, you know, Danny, Kenny, Big George, Davy, Victor, they, they looked really real talented boys, but I, th- I think, and it's not for me to say, but I think he could have kept the older team a year or two longer and let the boys get through better, a bit better, you know, but they were always going to be super players because they were great young lads, and all good lads as well, all willing to listen and learn. And were you able to assist these young guys coming through the ranks? Well, I'd need to say they were easy to help because they had natural ability and they were dead keen to learn. I mean, Kenny and Danny and boys like that, they were just... Nothing was a problem for them. I, I played wide a few games and training games. You played against Danny and you think, well, I'm an experienced player. I've got a European Cup medal. I've played for Scotland against England at Wembley. But this boy wants to kick me and he wants to run me off the ball. So, I mean, he was, he was, they were just wanting to learn whatever they could. They were just great. The Lions regularly played the Quality Street kids up at Barrafield. Was that your hardest game of the week? Oh, they, 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 they could play that, they really could. But I think I think Big Job mixed the teams quite a lot and they'd, they'd get into our team and, and so they were used to playing with the guys. And But they were, as I keep saying this, they were all terrific talents. What can you recall, Bobby, of the 1969 Scottish Cup final and in particular the performance of young George Conley? He just took it so casual and so easy. He was just George's great ability. I mean, he could he was wonderful with the ball at his feet, and he was so laid back. I mean, he was for the third goal. He just got the ball around the goal, and put it in the net as if I'm just up the park here. It was just, just he was just great. So cool, by George. Now, three years after we were triumphant in Lisbon, we suffered the disappointment of the 1970 European Cup final defeat to Feyenoord. What do you think Celtic could have done differently? I think. We didn't play particularly well on the night, and I think Feyenoord did play well on the night. I thought they deserved to win the cup on the night, but I still feel had we got to got to the final whistle with, with a draw, we could have maybe done better in the in the, in the replay. But everybody, everybody thought we were certainties. But I know, I know that most of the guys didn't think we were certainties. We knew that you don't get to European Cup final and be a bad team, so we knew we had a game in our hands, and we scored first. And I think the worst thing that happened was they scored quite quickly after us, if I remember rightly, and that didn't help. And then, as I say, they scored right at the death, and it was, it was all over then, you know. Do you feel that Jockstein seen this as an opportunity to dismantle the Lions and start afresh by bleeding in 
some of the youngsters. Well, well, we didn't think that, but obviously it was when you see the team changing so quickly after after that. But uh, there's a lot of experience in the team, and, and they boys needed the experience to help them coming through. But uh, I, I suppose that was a defining moment when they decided we better start bringing the boys through. Now, a number of the Quality Street kids moved on for big money down to England. Had we kept that group together, what do you think we might have achieved? Well, you just never know. Football was a strange game. You know, teams get better and better. Clubs get stronger and stronger. So you really, you're really not sure what's going to happen in, in the future in football. It's, it's a hard thing to say. Uh, but, they, but they guys were great, so they could have got better. But I still feel as though you needed some more experienced guys round about them. But a few of the boys left at the one time, which didn't. Which probably to let the young boys through, but I don't know if it helped the club or not. How big a loss to Celtic and Scottish football was George Conley? I think Big George could have done anything. He could have achieved anything. But how, how, how would I say? Some days he came to the part and wasn't he up for it, didn't feel right up for it. Just lovely, lovely guy. I mean, I thought he was terrific. But he, I think George could have been a great player, better than he was if he'd stayed longer. But he just, what can you say? It's your personality. One player who didn't move down south was Danny McGreen. He's often been regarded as a world-class player. Is that something you would agree with, Bobby? Never liked him. <laughs> Danny could have played in any team. Danny was, Danny was world-class, there's no doubt about that. He was, <laughs> I like saying this, he was a wonderful goal scorer as well. <laughs> I like thought he scored eight goals or something. <laughs> I love getting them on about that. But Danny was, Danny was the man. Danny, I thought Danny was great and a great captain as well. When you think back to Neely Mawkins' role on the coaching staff, how important was he to the victory in Lisbon? The victory in Lisbon, Neely was just important every day. Everywhere you went, Neely was there, there always a smile on his face. You never got him any different. He was just a great guy about the place. If anyone had a problem, they'd go to Neely before they go to the boss. They went, everybody, everybody just went, went and spoke to Neely. He used to, <laughs> he'd come out and be Jimmy and his room every day and he would look at the two of us and oh, we'd sniff and go and open the curtains and lift the windows and walk out again, you know. He was... Neely was great for the club, he really was. Neely was known for being a joker and a prankster. Do you have any memories of this side of his character? I, yeah, he probably had a couple of great lines in his time, you know. My, my green tooth should never throw tomatoes, you know what I mean? And uh, that song, was it? My, my, my Dolores, Neely was sang Seed of Delilah. He, he, he was just a bundle of fun. And how do you think Neely's role changed as the years progressed? Neely, Neely went from being the trainer to the kit man, really, and he was always in about the, the, the boot room, and then any time he did it in, he went and seen Neely, and it, Neely was just a fixture at the part, like, you could always go and speak to Neely, I don't really remember, and I'm probably wrong here, but I don't really remember Neely having a day off, every time and Neely was there, and if, if you walked in later on after maybe you stopped playing, and some of the first team about Neely would say, oh here's one of the good players coming, you know, and he, he could embarrass you, put you, and put you, and put you down, you know. How important to a club like Celtic is a figure like Neely Mocking who knows the history and traditions of the club? I think that's vitally important. I, I think players come in, modern players, I, I'm, I'm just guessing as modern players come in and don't know much about, about the club really. But if you're a guy like Neely about that could... I mean, we John Clark's there just now. And, and John's great for the club, I think. And Neely was the same. Neely was always there and always about the place and could always... Bring you down, you know, he'd like to bring you, bring you down in a, in a funny way. But I see we John's the same. Where would you rate Neely Mocking in the all-time Celtic greats? Oh, nearly about there, nearly about high there, I'll tell you that. I, I think it's hard to say who's who's this and who's that, but nearly was well up there. We, nearly was great for our team, nearly was great for our club. He's looking at the ground and he's looking at the goal and he says, just about here. And I went, what, what, what happened just about here? He says, the Coronation Cup final. As far as I can remember, it's just, it was a throw in. The ball was flung in and it just bounced and he just hit it. He took me aside and put me on a spot that was maybe 45 yards from goal. Tommy Younger maintained to this day that he got a fingertip and uh, he says, Younger never saw it. And he says, the big man was crying, he says, crying. You know, it's a sort of goal, like Superman would score, Popeye, you know, but uh, he says, ah, he's surrounded about here, he says, but Younger never saw it. I remember Neely Mocking scoring a goal 
uh, at Celtic Park for Morton. And somebody had mentioned to him, uh, mentioned to me that in all probability Celtic were interested in him. And eventually he came along. My first memory was like, I think every support maybe my age was when he came, his first three games were at Hamden, won three cups or so. <laughs> but um, the Coronation Cup, I was at the final. And uh, the ticket, it was seven shillings and sixpence for the centre stand. And I was about from here to the fence there, off the presentation. And I remember nearly scoring a goal. Uh, 20 odd yards, but as I said, when you came here to play with Celtic, nearly had it away about 50 yards by the time, you know, he, it was, he always added yards, 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 you know. And you said, even with the old brown ball, nearly, he says, I could hit it with anything. I think one thing always was always important to beat Rangers. <laughs> that was a big factor with Nelly. And he obviously played in that 7-1 game as well. One of the most famous sort of all for games ever for a Celtic point of view. But my greatest memory of Nelly as a player was in 1960. They played St Mern three cup ties. First game was at Love Street, one each draw. Second game was at Celtic Park. It was a four each draw after extra time. In the third game, Celtic won 5 2 and nearly scored all five goals. Remember what a tremendous personal triumph that was. I scored four goals, and of course, I'm getting took off, and I'm thinking, I said, Take away, take me off her. And he's going, Pfft. and he just looked at nearly, and nearly's in the bench laughing. You know, and he comes walking in, and you know, you, you've got to laugh. You know, any normal, any normal person would be raging. Um, I knew exactly what he meant, because nearly scored the five, you know, and you know, you never beat me, son. I, I, he probably had a couple of great lines in his time, you know. My, my green tooth never throw tomatoes, you know what I mean? And uh, that song, was it? My, 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 Dolores nearly was sang to Delilah. It, it, it was just a bundle of fun. But I think it's vital. People might, you know, to bring in f maybe foreign managers or foreign players, but there's a lot to be said for the the local player, you know. If you, you look at Baresi with AC Milan, Puyo with, with Barcelona. These were these were locals. These guys, um, even Man United, um, Paul Scholes, people like that. Um, yeah, people might think the game's changed that a lot. It's, so it has. But I think that part of the bit when things are going against you, and in the dressing room, these people are vital. Evan Williams, what are your memories of arriving at Celtic Park in 1969? Obviously I was in Loneville living goals and I kind of went there and Newcastle were after me as well and a short talk with their manager about Ian McFall and but I knew that Celtic were interested because Big Jock had phoned me a few times but once before, don't tend to give us a chance to talk to you and there was, what about, I can remember I think the 60, 65 pound a week with Wolves and Villa were offering over £100 a week, so was Newcastle, which was a lot of money then, 1969. And I uh, had, uh, well, I was talking to my wife about it, she says, now, what are you doing? I'm going up to Celtic Park on the train today. Make sure you get the same as they've offered you, because we, we could, with a sign on fee, we could have bought two houses. But I bought a house and this was debt free for, for, for living. So I come up to Park and joke. Met me, took me into the boardroom and sat down. Here's the deal, £50 a week and £1,000. <laughs> I signed when I had my wife. You off your head. <laughs> I says, I've always wanted to play there and that was it. I always thought if I didn't get a game, I would always go back to England. But it worked out quite well for me, so I can't complain. But the, playing with the, the Quality Street gang, that was an education unbelievable. All these young kids, Dalgleish and McGrain and all them. And John Gorman, Jimmy Quinn, Pat McCluskey. He, he played a game at Kilmarnock, I think it was one of my first games down there, the first half, or 5 0 up or something. I had one kick of the ball the whole first half. I'm saying, what am I going to do? I'm never going to get in the game here and to play the first team. So I said to the boss on Monday morning about it, he just laughed, and that was it, kind of finished. But it was an education playing with the quality of the quality of players they had. 
Did you see the Quality Street kids as heirs to the Lisbon Lions throne? Oh, I would say so because we used to play them in practice games and some days they gave us a doing. I mean, it wasn't as if we were doing well in Europe at the time, couldn't give them a doing. They were up every bit as good as us in a lot of the games, the Barrafield practice games. I thought they were going to become a lot of top, top pros. Now, by the time that Celtic had reached the European Cup quarter final against Fiorentina, you had established yourself as Celtic's number one. What are your memories of that tie? Well, at Celtic Park, we won 3 0 and we played very well. But the, the second game in Florence was one of Jock's nightmares as he, he, he nearly had a heart attack with me. We were 1 0 down at half time. And just after half time, Amarildo, the Brazilian international player, took a free kick for them and bent the ball around the wall. And it came straight to me, and I walked out of the road and the ball went in the net. So Jock came running around the back of the goal at Florence and he said, um, What are you doing? What are you doing? He says, Boss, don't worry about it. It's an indirect free kick. It's an indirect free kick. <laughs> well, he went off his head. And, he, and after the game, went into the dressing room. We, we only could beat 1 0, so we qualified for the semi final. And uh, the referee comes in and says, Big Sherman referee, well done, goalkeeper. Somebody knows the rules of the game. He went out and Big Jock says, All oh, rules of the game, you see, if you know when you don't let any ball pass you. It was bad enough sitting there watching that without you didn't think for that. This victory linked up a battle of Britain, tie against Leeds United. How did you prepare for this game? I always remember I went down to Troon to train, and I'd played against Leeds United uh, three times with Wolves. And Jackie Charlton, I would, one game I'd beat Leeds at, at uh, Ellen Road, and they get a corner kick in the last minute. Johnny Jails put over, and Jackie Charlton stood up and stood my boot into my my big toe, and he made it one each way on a full time whistle. But that again was a, a learning period for me as well. And Jock says to me, Look, what we're going to do, we're going to stick Billy. When Charlton stands on top, Billy will stand in front of him. I says, boss, that's not good. This area is my area. What do you mean, he says? I've got to go over two of the tallest men in British football to get the ball. And also Charlton's going to be back in it. I says, that's my... It's up to me to, to look after Charlton. And he said, well, you're not playing. You're not doing as you're told. And we, we left the hotel and we went on the train down to Leeds. We were sitting... Uh, we were kind of downcast. One or two of the boys was up and said, well, I've been told I'm not playing. And... Uh, the sliding door and the old trains opened up nearly mocking was there. Boss wants to see you. And they uh, along and then Sean sitting nearly Bob Rooney all sitting Wally Fernie. And Jock says, Well look, he says you're getting your way, you're playing, but it's on your head if you beat tonight. <laughs> but the first cross ball I came off I, I caught the ball but I'm right through Charlton and he never came near me after that. How important were Davy Hay and George Conley in the victory against Leeds United? Oh, I think they were fantastic. I think uh, Davy Hay was a great, great defender, great player to play with. They never, not many people could get past Davy, and he was very hard and all. Doing. And George was a different class talent. The only thing I didn't like about George, George was pull the ball, ball down the six yard box, try not make people. I used to cough my head, but he always got away with it. He never really got caught. He, a great talent. I thought the George was going to go at the top. What happened? I don't know. I thought he was going to be a top-class player like Davy, because Davy had a great career up till his injuries. Do you think it was an error on Jock Steen's part to leave George Conley out of the final? I would think, uh, being honest, no, he didn't make many mistakes, Jock, and I think he should. He George was in fire then. I mean, he was playing great, and that, that was his decision. And he, yo, he would, nobody ever questioned Big George's decision because ninety-nine percent of the time he was right, but you know, I think he made a wee mistake that night. What were your memories in the lead up to the final? Well, it was, I think Celtic had played so many games in Europe in those years. Uh, we just went through the same routine of training and did all the things, and they would talk about the game and what we were going to do in that. And we didn't turn up in the night. And this talk about uh, money, that was a load of garbage. I never, I never heard them talking about money. Um, and they just think it's one of those nights. I think we only got beat two games that season. was the. Uh, Scottish Cup final and that that game and just one of these we didn't turn up at all I mean if you talk to him do you ever go to your own job and have a bad day I think the whole team just had a bad day that time Was that defeat a watershed moment and was a decision made to bleed more quality street kids through as a result of that defeat 
I think so. He, 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 he brought in Kenny and he brought in uh, Vic Davidson a few games the first team and Pat McCloskey came into the team and Jimmy Quinn had quite a lot of games as well. They, they started to bring him in a bit at a time and it, I think the Wispy and John Hughes got sold off and Bobby Murdoch went to Middlesbrough um, and Betty went to Hibs. Tommy came away to Norris Forest so it was all kind of a breaking up period. How much of a tragedy was it that George Conley was entirely lost to the game? Well, I think the the, the football world missed that a great talent. I think the, his talent was unbelievable. He's reading the game, he's skilling the ball. He was a good player to watch. He wasn't just an out-and-out out defender where he matched somebody up on that. He could, took part in the game. He could score goals, he could dribble past people. I think George did everything. He had the world at his feet. I don't know what happened. That was his own personal thing. But he was, he, was, he, was, he was a big, quiet guy. He was not a, what would you call it, boisterous or anything. He was always very quiet. Thing we, 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 we've gone very well with him, but he just, we don't know what happened to him. Had we kept the Quality Street gang together, what would Celtic have achieved as a club? I think we would have kept it up there, there, there in Europe because I think we played at that time, they played two finals and four semi-finals. And that's the kind of Inter Milan, Ajax and stuff. Up, they were always there or thereabouts. And even you would even feel the English boys would say, we don't want Celtic European Cup because we're going to have a hard game. And a lot of teams didn't want to play us, especially Celtic Park. Because the record at Celtic Park was unbelievable in Europe then. How underrated do you think Paul Wilson was as part of that gang? I think I felt sorry for uh, Paul... Uh, but he, he didn't break through as he said earlier but a bit later on 2021, 22 before they got in the first team but then Paul was unlucky you had Jimmy Jones and, and uh, Bobby Lennox were the wingers and very very hard to break those two down and especially we Bobby Lennox he played another 12 years after that or something he, and he went away and come back and played again and won another two league championship matches I think Bobby's got 38 or 40 medals with Celtic which is what I'm Paul was just unlucky, but he, he ended up having a good career. He's a good player, Paul. How important was the backroom team to the success of Celtic during the 1960s and 70s? I've always had a wee thing since I got older and looked back at the game. There's too many people coaching in the game that have never played the game at a certain level. But Big Jock's backroom staff all played at top level. They all knew the game inside out. And it was a great mixture. And they weren't a yes sir, no sir, three bags full. You could hear them get on to each other and discuss it and, and openly like the way they think they should be played. They just didn't sit and say nothing. What part did Neely Mockin play in that famous boot room? And Neely was a character. It's the, he's a great guy. It was a, I mean, I was a kid. I used to go and watch him. He was a great player. And he, he was good for Celtic. He was a great go between the players and the boss and Sean and the boss. And he, he was always a smile in his face, but he kept on top. He was a very, very strict man as well, and even though he was good ways. He used to always take you a walk at Seamill before you, just after your dinner, and go along the road and then come along the beach. And one year we went to Israel and we played uh, the Israeli international team. I think we won 5 0 or something. But the night before the game, after dinner, we went for a walk. So we went along the road in uh, Tel Aviv, went down on the beach climbed these stairs down. This time dust comes quick in Israel. It went dark and we're walking along the beach and I went, where are we going to be in that? And all of them they said, just along here, just along here. Next minute all these tanks came and the army lorries and that with guns <laughs> got off you weren't allowed on the beach. We were on the beach. I wonder if we never get shot. He was he was always laughing and joking really and, and you know we be going for a walk it wasn't a, a wee casual walk. It was a quick walk, because I think he was a great man with the dogs, and he was always walking the dogs, a hundred mile an hour. He was like going for a, for, for a run, never mind a walk. And he, was, he, he always loved the patter with the players and talked away. And he always remember in Bermuda once, and the boss went away, we were over on holiday. We played a couple of games, and because we'd won the, the double, he took us over to Bermuda to play these games. And we had a five days free. So I'm not going to mention the players in the room, but nearly come in one day come on he's knee up I've arranged another game and he opened the curtains he's all this carry out he says I've made a drink there that's doing in the bar doing the hotel room <laughs> so we got a row 
he says, get out of here for the big man sees that I'll go off, he says, but he's on holiday, we're just having a couple of beer and a whiskey, he, he just says, oh, get out of the street, get rid of it for us, he always, he always looked after us. And of course he played a part in ensuring that you didn't miss your first match against Rangers. Well, the, the boss said to me when they were just five weeks after I'd signed, he says, right, I'm going to play in Saturday against St Mirren and see how you go on, see if you're ready for... I think he said to John Fallon, look, you've been given Evan a game to get... John was in the team at the time. So I played the, the, at St Mirren and at Clyde, we won 2 nothing each game. And the old firm game was at Parkhead the next game. So I was in the first team pool. And thinking, I've not, I've just had my two games out, and I stood outside and I'm talking to my two brothers and giving them tickets. And they came out, oh, get in there, you're backside in there. Oh, you're playing. If he knows you're out here and you don't know you're, he's read the team out and you weren't there, it's going to be trouble sitting in there. And that's how I learned I was playing against Rangers. And we do nothing each that day. So it's quite a good start to my career in front of the Celtic fans. Neely became notorious for hoarding training gear and boots. What are your memories of this trait with Neely? Uh, obviously, somebody's kept you well informed. I uh, always mind when I came up for was my, my squad number was 13. And uh, we got this 13 jersey, there's a big hole under here. And uh, a hole in the, the elbow. I'm saying this is a European champion. I've seen we've got this, this old gear and the socks one of the best either. And, uh, and I said to Bobby Murdoch, I oh, said, that's just that. He says, we've always got that here. And uh, I said, when I played with Villa there, we had a, a dress tracksuit and a working tracksuit. And so you're in the telly and about your tracksuit, brand new shoes and all that. And always oh, you look at that here. But that was just, uh, and nearly used to wind up. You're yeah, looking smart today and all that kind of thing. How important to a club like Celtic is a figure like Neely Mocking, who knows the history and knows what the club is all about. Neely played with a great Celtic team. You know, at the time that was the time Jock came on board as a centre half, and the, the, the players, I mean, you can see Boner, Hockney, Fallon, Evans, Stephen Peacock, Higgins, Neely was outside left, Charlie Tully. They're all great players. And Neely was brought up in that kind of way. And the, 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 the Lisbon Lions were a entertaining team as well. And Neely had a lot to do with the training and the coaching as well. He was always telling things. And I remember one of the afternoons I was back doing a bit of extra goalkeeping because uh, I like to do a wee bit extra because we learned in England to do certain things. And uh, he would say, Neely come back, he started shooting in. I never asked him again. <laughs> Never seen him that could hit a ball him in my life. Even at that age, you used to hit it from 30 yards and all, used to scream. Where do you regard Neely Mocking in the list of all-time Celtic greats? Well, Neely's up amongst the best of them. There's no end out with that. Character, trustworthy, great ability, and they could read the game and all that. And they kept us informed. Don't be doing that and don't be doing that. I always say, look, if you can out, don't go here and do it there. He's always seem a step ahead of us. And I remember when we retired, went to a function and Neil was there with his wife and I think it was through in Denny, near where he stays. And I went to the bar and Neil came out and said, Neil, do you want a, a drink? A whiskey, he says, but don't let a big jock say, leave it around the corner then I'll get it later on. <laughs> Even then, you know, just, he kept his respect for the boss not to be too much one of the boys. Which was good. The boys loved him a bit. He was always happy-go-lucky and talking all the time. And, and if he did something wrong, he was slaggy rotten. He didn't get a chance for him. 